Surely Damon Hill didn't say that about Charles Leclerc. Surely not. And I mean, it, it, it's techy. But we've got to get techy here. And this is one of those ones where you go back after the fact and do a cheeky review. Have a look at what everybody said after the fact at the Japanese Grand Prix. And Damon Hill for the Tifosi. When I say Tifosi, I'm talking about Charles Leclerc fans, aren't I? That's what we're talking about uh, in earnest here. Because the Tifosi... Alas, Charles Leclerc fans have been coming for Damon Hill for the longest time now because they don't like him. They don't like him and they don't like what he's got to say, do they, Grey Squirrel, each and every single time? I want to say that they're a bit sensitive, but far be it for me to be the one to call F1 sensitive, F1 fan sensitive even, after the diatribe that I've been going on with over the past 48 hours, aimed at none other than the outfit from Brackley and Bricksworth. But here's what Damon Hill said. And he's had a bit of a trap record. In fact, let me set the scene for you guys first and foremost. Charles Leclerc hasn't had the best of seasons by any accounts. And he's a brilliant driver, super fast, point to point, A to B, one of the fastest drivers that we've ever seen. But he's getting nailed by Carlos Sainz Jr. at the moment. They're pretty much level on points in the championship, notwithstanding the fact that Carlos Sainz has raced one less race. And that is chaos, damning even. For all of Charles Leclerc fans, it speaks to something that's more insidious, if you ask me. And that, of course, is that Carlos Sainz is better able to optimise for his performance, for his lot, race-savvy strategy, being able to think his way through a race, if not a championship, better than his teammate on the other side of the garage. One Charles Leclerc. But I digress. Because Damon Hill, legend, champion... Sky Sports F1 broadcaster for the longest time has been very critical of Charles Leclerc. And you've got to categorise these criticisms right because, again, not dissimilar to I've been going on with over the past 24 hours with Mercedes. Some will say, Cameron, stop being overly critical of Mercedes. Why are you talking about them with this forked tongue? That's what some will say, outlaw. You know what I mean? And I, th I don't think I'm deserving of that. Some criticisms, people, teams are worthy of. Go on then, let's talk about Charles Leclerc. Because I think, in my humble opinion, I'll tell you what I think first before we get onto what Damon said. Because what I think of Charles Leclerc, I think he's a brilliant driver. But I think he has foibles. There are deficiencies there. And they are playing out in real time as per Carlos Sainz. Being as near as makes no difference, level on points. He shouldn't be. Charles Leclerc should be running rings around Carlos Sainz Jr. He should never get close to him, a la 2022, when Charles Leclerc got to business right and raced away clear from one Carlos Sainz Jr. In 2023, however, and in 2021, they've been very bloody close. I've said this a million times and I will say it again for the avoidance that Carlos Sainz is a pothole in Vegas away from being 2-1 up in terms of championship points as versus Charles Leclerc. And that to me is bonkers. If you're doing the waterfall analysis and comparing and contrasting, you've got it. There's things that you've got to pick out there. And one of those is underperformance. Another of those is Charles Leclerc not being assertive enough in the race. Ferrari have it in them to make a cheeky mistake, a cheeky error, Matthew. They do. They do, and we just got to admit to that, right? And Charles Leclerc's got to be cognizant of that if he's to become the god-tier racing driver that we all know he can be, that he has the minerals to grow into. As you exhibit A, Tate Brazil 2022, I want to say. You remember qualifying, when they were qualifying for the sprint race and rain was due and Ferrari sent out Charles Leclerc on Inters. Rain was due, that doesn't mean rain was here right. And in quality, as in the race, it's really important to be on the best tyres, the right tyre even, at the right bloody time. So why did Charles Leclerc have that from Ferrari then? Why would you not push back unless you are overly submissive, not assertive enough when it comes to the, the inter-team dynamics Per Carlos Sainz Jr., who on many occasions at this point has pointed out, has pushed back constructively to his team and told them that they're barking up the wrong strategic tree. No, let's do this. 
As per Monaco, his brilliant performance when he stopped once when all others around him were stopping twice. Charles Leclerc can't or hasn't at least shown the capacity to do that on a frequent basis. Okay, cool. At Japan, he did that for the first time that we've seen in ages. Push back on the team. Plan B, plan C, plan A, throw those out the window. How about we do plan C owing to the fact that I'm poor in terms of trap position? I need to go long is what Charles Leclerc said. Cheeky bit of dialogue between him and the pit crew. And then, okay, it plans out and it works out. That's what I want to see from Charles Leclerc. More of that, por favor. But up until now, there's been his career for me at Ferrari has been one of unfulfilled promise. He's been littered with unforced error. And more pertinently, more concerningly for me as an F1 consumer, is the fact that he lacks the, he's almost too nice, too meek and mild. He lacks that capability to push back on Ferrari and say, you know what, I disagree with this. There's a really good video where, you, where they're looking at, um, I think Ferrari put it out actually over the past couple of weeks, where they're looking at Carlos Sainz Jr. They're feeding back. And if you hear the, the terms in which Carlos Sainz Jr. is talking, he's very precise. Like he... Um, Umbrella terms for everything. Every all, all his messages are neatly compartmentalized. Like he's very clear and concise in his communication. As versus Charles Leclerc, when he's feeding back, it's like he's talking about what he did. I, I outbraked myself into this turn. Is that, how is that useful feedback for your engineers? Oh, the type like he's not giving. He's not succinct and concise in his communication. So I see why he gets into. A Monaco, as an example, when he's coming into the pit, like he, that sort of communication can cause confusion. Whereas Carlos Sainz is super concise and he just hones down, zones in very neatly into the message that the engineers needed. Are you guys taught to break God tier content creator and an ex performance engineer of Max Verstappen? And if you listen to the communication that he had with Max Verstappen, when he talks about it, Super quick, concise, zoning very quickly on the messages that are important, right? The key themes over a race weekend. That's what engineers need. And that's what they're getting from Carlos Sainz Jr. and his side of the garage. And that's what they're lacking from Charles Leclerc, or at least have been lacking from Charles Leclerc hitherto. And I think that's bloody important. Now that I've said that, listen to, go back and watch the post-race press conference and listen to Carlos Sainz Jr., that, and I don't want I don't want to make this into a Carlos Sainz Jr. celebration party, but go back and listen to him in the way that he talks. That's good. The, one of the journos asked a question of both Carlos, Max, and Checo. And Max said that the question is this: What do you make of first time we're going back to the Chinese Grand Prix in a in a long while? What do you make of the fact that we're doing a sprint race at the Chinese Grand Prix? After a long hiatus, Max Verstappen comes back and he goes this, and I don't think it's a good idea. I think it's nonsense. If you're talking about if they want to switch it up, etc., then that's a good idea. But from a, a racer's perspective and an engineer's perspective, we have one practice session to, to set up the car and it's not good enough. Checo Perez echoes those sentiments. Fast forward to Carlos Sainz Jean. You know what Carlos says? Check this out. He plays back to the journal. He says, I think there's two questions in one there. The first, I'm like, hold on, Carlos, who is this guy? Aristotle. Yeah, how is he thinking like this? To the first, he says, I think it, China is a brilliant Grand Prix. The circuit's incredible. It's different. And I think it's I think it's a privilege privilege for us to go back there as racing drivers. To the second, however, that we're doing a sprint race after such a long hiatus back at the Chinese Grand Prix, I think it poses problems, particularly in a rule and reg set that's so finicky. We've got to deal with plank wear. It's a street set. Like he just goes on, just goes in and deep dives. Like he says, we've got a problem. We need to do due diligence. There's not time enough to, for it to set up the car. The rules and regs don't give us that. And I think it needs a rethink. I'm listening to this dude. I'm thinking, is this, is this chap a politician? Like how, how, this is bonkers that he can talk like that and he's thinking in that 4D way. And I think therein lies the problem for Charles Leclerc as at April of 2-4 because he's always going to be compared first and foremost, against his teammate. And I think that's a big issue for him because 
as far as his speed advantage, it's almost like he's got an equal and opposite deficit in thinking about F1. In terms of race IQ and execution, we saw that in qualifying at Australia. Doesn't manage the tyres well over one lap, does he, Jomo? It's, it's, he just doesn't do it. He doesn't have that ability. So for all of the speed advantage that he has over a car loss, I feel like he loses at least that potentially more in terms of his race IQ and lack of assertiveness, lack of race and strategic awareness. And Damon Hill's sp spoken to that. Listen, let me tell you about who Damon Hill is. Damon Hill is an, is an old English gent. Here, here's who Damon Hill is. And this is, this is where it gets techy. Damon, so Damon is a champion, right, 1996 he won, should have won in 94, but for Michael Schumacher's indiscretions and the FIA being a bit a bit noddy and a bit numpty, as is always the way. Should be a two-time world champion. But he, Damon Hill's dad, Graham Hill, is a two-time champion. Bastion of motor racing and all things daredevil. Graham won in 68, and I want to see Graham, Graham also won in 62. Two-time champion, yeah. But Graham Hill, Damon's dad, died in an airplane accident again. Different time and different levels of safety. Different rate of, of crashes and accidents and fatal ones at that. So that's where Damon comes from. That sort of daredevil. I mean, he's, he's old man passed in an accident. Fast forward now to Damon's career in 1994. So I think, I'm going to say Damon started, Damon started F1 late, started motorsport late. But in 1994, we all remember that this is the year that Senna passed Tamborello San Marino. There was a lot at the time. There was a lot of rumour, there, there was a lot of speculation as to what caused that accident from Senna. It looked innocuous. It was a weird accident, Senna's. Absolutely, but for that bloody tyre, Senna, the tyre impact on Senna's head, Senna would not have passed. It was a very innocuous incident. But nevertheless, post Senna's passing, there was a lot of rumour and speculation. And again, I live through this. I'm old enough so I can tell you this. I don't need to go back and fact check and read articles. I remember. I remember writing articles on this in, in like primary school. Post the race... Post Senna's passing, there was a lot of rumour and speculation around what caused the accident. And immediately, British media, from my perspective, was pointing the finger at Adrian Newey and Frank Williams because they thought, they were like, how did Senna's the best driver that we've ever seen? How did he have that accident? The plug was that his machinery was deficient. There was something in the car, whether it was the brakes or the aero stalling, or so there was something that led up to Senna crashing at Tamborello and ultimately killed the greatest driver that we've ever seen in our lives. That was the rumour and speculation. And ultimately, with history, that's kind of since dissipated somewhat with the plank. Ultimately, what well, we know the story, what happened, that the aero did stall, but since then, they've installed planks and et cetera, et cetera. The tyres the tire lost pressure because the safety car was going around too slow, et cetera, et cetera. But post, the fact of it was that post the San Marino Grand Prix, the vast majority of F1 aficionados and mainstream press thought that there was something wrong with that Williams car, that Adrian knew he'd done that Adrian knew he thing, as he does tend to do sometimes, and pushed the innovation envelope too far, causing the greatest, the Brazilian, the genius, the best that we've ever seen to sadly perish. That was the, that was the party line. That was the yarn that we were being spun, the narrative that was being pushed forth. Remember then, who was who was Ayrton Senna's teammate in that Williams in 1994? Damon Hill. Damon Hill. I've, I've wanted to make a video about this for the longest time. Can you imagine then? Let me put this to you. So David Coulthard came into that car to replace Ayrton Senna alongside one-time champion Damon Hill. Can you imagine then? in 1994, post the San Marino Grand Prix, when there is all this talk about the car that you're going to drive for the next race weekend being dangerous, potentially of ki potentially responsible, culpable for the death of the teammates that you raced alongside, the greatest racing driver that we've ever seen. Do you think I'm getting in that car? 
Let me ask you the question, non-rhetorical one. Are you going to get in that car next race weekend when all the world's media are talking about this car that you're about to buckle up in having killed the greatest driver that we've ever seen? Shades of Jim Clark, right? One of the goatiest drivers that we've, again, that we've ever seen put on a, a six-point harness or two-point at the time, whatever it was. Jim Clark, of course, having won the championship in 73-63. In 65, if Jim can die, then he, he's the best that we've ever seen, right? Then we're all toast. Like, who survived? Like, this is the point that was being made, right? And so Damon Hill, I'm going to give him credit because if that was any other driver, I don't think many of us would get in that car again after Senna's perishing. Why? What, when the rumour is that the car was somehow responsible, whether it was aero, stall, brake fail, whatever, what you think 99% of drivers aren't going to say, you know what, that, that that's it for me. Let me go and take care of my wife and my kids and my family and prioritise my life. Mate, you, can you imagine? I'm not getting in that car again. What, after Senna dies? Behave yourself. So now Senna's passed, your teammates passed, and and your old man, and this remember, lest we forget, is the weekend when Roland Ratzenberger died as well. So multiple deaths in F1. Some people are saying that your car's dangerous. Your dad passed away as well from in an aircraft accident. And you want me to go and buckle up in that car the very next race weekend? That's what you're telling me. That's, that's madness. And so I say all that to say that Damon Hill, to tell you who Damon Hill is, the man that Damon Hill is, because that dude, listen, if you're thinking about, if you want to talk about F1 drivers and bravery, that Damon Hill jumped back into that car and raced Suzuki, as an example, the Japanese Grand Prix that year, raced hard and pushed and extracted every tenth out of that car between Senna's passing and the end of that season. I think that's absolutely remarkable. Honestly, Damon Hill is a complete, in terms of bravery at the very, say whatever you want to say about his, his upper ceiling as an, as an F1 driver. And people always compare him unfavorably to the likes of Schumacher and Alonso and whoever else at the time, Packen and two. But if you're talking about bravery, to put everything that I'm about to say in context, to preface this accurately, if you're talking about bravery and courage, Damon Hill is right up there. You are having a laugh if you tell me any different bravery is Damon Hills and, and you look at Damon now and yeah, like he's an elderly gentleman and he, he strikes a meek and mild type character right Damon Hill is bravery weapons grade of that I'm not sure if we've seen too many more brave drivers in F1 history than him dad passed in an aircraft accident your teammates just just perished in in the car that you're driving and you you've got to buckle up in that same car next weekend that is is bonkers, ladies and gents. I only say that to say this. So it surprises me then, the tone, the way in which Damon talks about Charles Leclerc sometimes. Now look, there are accurate criticisms in there. When he's talking about Charles Leclerc's incident a couple of years back at the French Grand Prix, when he'd done the hard work, when he when he defended Max into, he, he'd nailed Max lap one, turn one, like he'd done all the he'd done all the heavy lifting right, but then a lapse of concentration, the likes of which we've seen Charles Leclerc do more than a few times before, and probably will see again. When he does something like that, Damon Hill is a straight shooter, if not anything else. And he criticized Charles Leclerc. And on that occasion, I think he was quite right to criticize Charles Leclerc. And he talked about Charles' mental state. Maybe he's a bit anxious now. Here's where it gets techy, isn't it? Jomo here and, and Little Grey Squirrel. Here's where it gets techy. Because obviously in 2024, with all that's going on in the world and all that's happened over the past 24 hours in particular, we need to be careful as broadcasters and content creators and human beings when we're talking about people's mental states, right? Like you've got to be cognizant of that. I agree. But that's not to say that you can't speak to truth. So on that occasion, when Charles stacked it in France, is it is it a crime to to question Charles like his 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 mental not aptitude, but his his mental state? 
Because, I mean, why else is his... You, you've got to speculate and conjecture, right? There's no... Nobody's talking definitively here because I'm not Charles Leclerc's... I'm not his... his I'm not his mental coach or his mentor. I'm not close enough to him. But you've got to... I think Damon, in exploring, is asking questions. Why? Why a driver who's so good, so god tier, that can defend Max Verstappen like no one else on the grid can in 2024, into turn one, lap one at the French Grand Prix? Why would he then go and make such a noddy mistake? He's done all the heavy lifting. You can't do the former and then fail at the latter. It just doesn't make sense. So I understand why Damon's asking questions why, trying to understand the causality of the thing and asking questions as to whether Charles was anxious. You guys remember the bloody um, the reaction in the in the car afterwards when he's in the barrier? The accelerator, he's trying to reverse out, right? And he says, the accelerator's not working. What's going on with the accelerator? You can hear him, he's chomping at the bit he wants to fix for this unforced error and then you get the infamous the shrill scream from the monogasque no no and you've heard that from him on more than one occasion right you heard it in monaco's as well when they told him to pit and then he's realized that carlos is already in there and have double stacked and he's going no then he's slamming the steering wheel. I would say personally that that's just Charles Leclerc losing it. It's frustration more than more than emblematic of any deeper seated, insidious mental anxiety or stress. That's my humble opinion. I just think in the moment Charles is frustrated with himself because he knows how good he is. He knows the level of peddler that he can be, and so yet another mistake. The likes of which we've seen at Monaco, France, Imola too. Yet another mistake when he's so capable of doing ridiculous things, the likes of which very few can ever, have ever been capable of doing, is frustration. So I think that's my humble opinion. But Damon, when assessing it, couches it in terms of, is he, is he, is it anxiety? What's going on with him? I don't think that's unfair. Now, we're knowing 2024, you guys are seeing all the stuff about what's going on in the world, socioeconomically, like Israel, like all this stuff is chaos, right? So I know that you have to handle that with kid gloves. I don't think it's unfair, though, at this point, with Damon Hill having gone through what he's doing, what he's gone through even, to question that sort of stuff. If anybody can speak to that accurately from first-hand experience, it would be Damon Hill. Lest we forget again for the avoidance of doubt, to reiterate, his dad passed in an aircraft incident. His teammate passed in an F1 incident. The most tragic weekend that we've seen in recent history where Senna died, the greatest that, that some of us will say we've ever seen. Roland Raxenberger perished too on that weekend. And Damon Hill had to buckle up in that car that many people thought was responsible for Ayrton Senna's death. The greatest of all time at that time. That's who we're dealing with here when we're talking about Damon Hill. So I think if anybody can talk to these issues from first-hand experience, then it would be Damon. Behave yourself. But then, here's what he says at the Japanese Grand Prix. And here's where I need to... I need to play devil's advocate and walk back some of what I've just bloody said because this is where it gets techy and this is where some of the Tifosi, Charles Leclerc fans aren't having it. And by the way, before I say that, let me say this. Charles Leclerc fans, as as with all F1 fans around the world, particularly Lewis Hamilton evangelist and Charles Leclerc fundamentalist, a die hard, right? To the point where you can't criticise. If you criticise Lewis or you criticise Charles, even if it is a valid criticism, those fans are going to come for you. They will leverage their confirmation bias and their availability heuristic to destroy your argument. They're not looking to, even if your argument is valid. And this is why I say that, because sometimes Charles Leclerc is absolutely worthy of criticism. However, parlay that into this. At this, this race weekend just passed at the Japanese Grand Prix. I'm going to do my best. Let me, let me hold back the emotions and the tears. Right. You guys know Jules Bianchi and what happened with Jules. Again, passed away at the Japanese Grand Prix. I want to say in 2000, 2015, I think. And Jules Bianchi, you'll know, was Charles Leclerc's godfather. Two notable examples. And again, I, I cite that to say this. 
two notable examples. When when Charles Leclerc's old man passed, he was racing, I want to say in F2 that race weekend, dropped it on pole and won the race. And again, the weekend when Jules passed, nailed that race weekend again. So I'm not saying that Charles isn't capable of 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 driving and performing under pressure. That would be outrageous to say there is evidence that diametrically opposes all of that. But I, I give you the Jules Bianchi example to say that obviously we were at Suzuka again last weekend, right? Reminiscent of Jules, Jules, Jules Bianchi's passing, who Charles Leclerc had links to. Jules, Jules Bianchi was Charles Leclerc's godfather for Pete's sake. So Charles Leclerc last weekend or weekend, couple of weekends ago was revisiting in his mind the scene of the crime. You saw the dedication on Charles Leclerc's helmet. So this now is a different level of sensitivity that we have to have as commentators and F1 content creators and broadcasters to the situation that Charles Leclerc is dealing with, right? This is what Damon Hill said. Get, get to the point, Cameron. This is what Damon Hill said if you haven't seen the footage last weekend. Talking of qualifying, doing the compare the market thing, as we just have between Carlos Sainz Jr. and Charles Leclerc, Damon Hill said something to this effect. In summary, the contrast between the two Ferrari drivers, you can say it as this. One was impressed, one was depressed. Because Charles Leclerc didn't manage to get it done for whatever reason. He was telling his pit crew that he wanted to come out, Damon said, and they were saying that he didn't want to come out. And at some point, you want to be assertive enough to make sure you get the push, push, pull or whatever the configuration of lap that they were doing. And that rests with Charles Leclerc. The latter of what Damon Hill has said there, I agree. Absolutely, Charles Leclerc needs to be more assertive. And he listened to Damon Hill in the race. That was proof positive of the fact that Charles Leclerc has it in him. He's not incapable of pushing back and having that dialogue. Indeed, in real time, he's learning from Carlos Sainz Jr. to do that. And that's worthy of praise. Where it gets techie, peddlers, chat, is the former. Because Damon, to, to, to make light of that circumstance at the Japanese Grand Prix, again, nearly eight years after Jules Bianchi's passing at this same Grand Prix, who Charles Leclerc has links to because he was Charles' godfather. To say depressed is insensitive at best from Damon. And I know for a fact that Damon wasn't cut. He wasn't poking the bear here, not deliberately at least. I know Damon. Damon's a nice, like he, he doesn't mean ill. He didn't say that to poke fun at Charles Leclerc's circumstance deliberately. Who would know better than not to do that? Bearing in mind, his old man passed in an aircraft incident. His, his teammate, Ayrton Senna, the greatest of all time, passed away in an F1 accident. Damon Hill would know more than most not to take advantage or, or, or take that situation any less seriously than it merits. But he's, it's an off-the-cuff statement. Damon absolutely should know better. At the Japanese Grand Prix, to say the D word, depressed, probably wasn't the way forward, was it, Damon? And I think in hindsight, if you were to get Damon on a mic and ask him to assess that commentary with the Jules Bianchi circumstance in mind, I'm sure Damon would retract that. I'm sure he would. And of course, the Tifosi, the fans of Charles Leclerc, because he's a very good looking chap, super fast, looks like Clark Kent mixed with Harry Potter. Of course, he's like, the Tifosi are going to come for him and they came for him. How dare Damon Hill talk about Charles Leclerc in this difficult moment? Why are you questioning somebody's mental state? But he wasn't questioning. So it wasn't that. He was insensitive. Damon Hill's got some vendetta against Charles Leclerc. Oh, wait. Not really. He kind of says it as it in that instance. Absolutely. Was it insensitive? You're gonna, if that's the criticism that you're going to leverage at the chap, then fair play. I will take that. You can't argue that he shouldn't have been talking about Charles Leclerc being depressed at the Japanese Grand Prix. Eight years post his godfather's passing, Jules Bianchi. That's not fair and that's not on. And I'm sure if you were to put a mic in front of Damon Hill's mouth, he would retract that. He, di he, he didn't have that 
front and center of his mind. Not to say that he wasn't cognizant of it, but in, in saying that, he clearly wasn't aware. And so I don't, I, not take a chill pill. That's not the way I want to word this, but just, I don't know. Do we need to be so bloody sensitive about our drivers all the time? He says, Cameron F1, Lewis Hamilton, dire tribes in mind. I don't know. I don't know. I, I think we've got to delineate now between valid criticism and bias. Because if you look at the drivers that Damon's criticised, he criticises all of them. It's just in his nature. I remember being crazy, getting mad at Damon for criticisms of Lewis. Very valid ones, by the way. Sebastian Vettelli's come for in the past. He's come for Sebastian recently saying, listen, the way he retired wasn't fantastic. I don't know if I'd give him a second opportunity in Mercedes. I don't think that would work out well, said Damon. What's wrong with that's true? He's just taught, he's out here and he's just giving you the gospel, right? And it... If it's your driver that he's criticising, surely you've got to be objective enough to say, well, if it's Charles Leclerc and he's talking about being assertive, that's a valid criticism. Okay, so it wasn't a valid criticism at Australia or, or the Japanese Grand Prix even when all of a sudden Charles Leclerc is starting to, do you know what I mean? Be more assertive. I'm pushing for the one-stop guys. Sack off plan B and plan C owing to my trap position. Have that dialogue. And he had it at the Japanese Grand Prix. And we all celebrated as F1 fans because that's Charles Leclerc becoming. But hitherto, erstwhile, Charles Leclerc hasn't had that in his locker, or at least he hasn't shown that to us. Please see Imola. Please see Brazil quali for the sprint in 21. Please see Monaco. Please see the Dutch Grand Prix. Please, every single time he's made France, he just makes mistakes and he causes. Listen, Ferrari are prone to a cheeky error. They absolutely are. But when you have a driver that's like ifing and butting, indecision, indecision central even, that's not going to help the circumstance. You need, you need a leader. You need like a Carlos Sainz Jr. who's going who's gonna to stand at the wall and say, this is the way that we're going to go. A la Monaco a couple of years back. I'm one stopping. I'm not doing two stops for inters and all this nonsense. I'm one stopping for, for dries. That's what Carlos Sainz was. And that helps, especially when you've got a team like Ferrari, who were in disarray for the past 36 months before Frederick Vasseur came on board. Let's have it right. That's the truth. So in that time of disarray and uncertainty, you need a leader who's going to, do you know what I mean? He's going to, he's going to, a, a bastion, who's going to imbue the team with some sort of surety, much needed. Not a Charles Leclerc, who whilst is super, super fast, Joe, my. He, he lacks that assertiveness, right? And he's prone to a, a cheeky, indecisive moment. France, for the avoidance of doubt. Imola, Brazil 21. Monaco, as near as makes no difference every bloody year. So can we not just be honest and open and just level that criticism at the Mon Monegasque? Because the evidence is there, right? You can make excuses for all that stuff as much as you want, but that's the truth. Valid criticism from Damon Hill. And again, I think he's just open and honest. However, I say all that to say this, calling Charles Leclerc depressed or questioning it. It was a euphemism, wasn't it? It was a metaphor. He wasn't calling Charles Leclerc depressed, but he was saying that his performance could be summarised in quali by the word depressed. And I agree with it, Defoe and millions of Charles Leclerc fans all, ar all around the world that that was at best insensitive, a mahusu faux pas at worst. And Damon, Damon will, I think Damon, again, if you were to get a mic in front of Damon and ask him retrospectively about that with an understanding about the context and circumstance, eight years post Jules Bianchi's death, who of course was the godfather of one Charles Leclerc, I think Damon would, um, he'd lean into that. He'd be quite open and honest to me, thinks and say, you know what, mere culpa, I shouldn't have used the word depressed. Either too though. I don't know, are you going to talk about Charles Leclerc's fortitude and his mental acuity, his ability to think his way through a race, especially in changeable conditions, the likes of which you've seen at Monaco, a cheeky, unforced error. If you're going to have an open and honest conversation about what's driving that, the root cause analysis of that, I, I think that's fair game. 
I, I'm just going to be honest. I don't think that's Damon Hill victimising necessarily any of the drivers. Sue who Damon is. He talks about these things honestly and openly, straight shooter settings. And I say again for the avoidance of doubt, if anybody is going to have a sensitivity to a godfather passing away in an F1 car. It should and will be Damon Hill for crying out loud. His father passed away, Graham, two-time champion, 62 and 68 for crying out loud. His teammate, Ertens Senna, three-time champion, passed away in the car that he was bloody driving in. So do you know what I mean? Don't question that dude's, like his, his own fortitude. I hear loads of comments saying, well, he was a second rate driver anyway. So what is he? Th nah, let's not do that with Damon. Not Damon. You were talking courage terms. There was nobody more stand up than that fella. Disappointing to see that he talked about Charles Leclerc in terms of depressed on that weekend. But it was a mistake. It wasn't Damon Hill being malicious. Put a mic in front of that chap's face and he will tell you as much. But between now and then, the prosecution rests. Love you guys to death. No further questions, Your Honour.